당신을 사랑해 영원한 공간을 당신의 모습이 사라지지 않기 기도하고 있을게요 아, 폐활량 <웃음> 완벽했어 훌륭했어 백만 미니몬스터 팬들이 사랑하고 있어, 좋아하고 있어 엄청 잘했어요 자, 오늘 이렇게 연주한 소감이 어때요? 괜히 숨겨온 예능감이 아니었습니다. 저는 진짜 항상 오늘 배운 게 있어요, 여기 와서. 아, 사람이 겸손해야 되는구나. 다시는 현악기 잘한다는 소리 어디 가서 하지 않겠습니다. 아, 너무 재밌었어요. 너무 재밌는 도전이었던 것 같습니다. 자, 이 미션은 성공입니까? 아닙니까? 세상에 없던 새로운 세마의 음악을 완성하라. 미션 성공! 저희와 함께 하셨던 시간들이 덜 모멘트 아니었기를 바라겠습니다. 세계에서 영상을 봐주신 여러분, 저희는 여러분들을 만나는 그날까지 모두 안녕! 안녕. Everything must be fun. Happy. 어, 멈추지 말고 항상 다음 일을 생각하라 라고 썼습니다. 인생은 혼자가 아니다. 내 주변에게 매 순간 감사하라 라고 적었습니다. 뭐 하다 보면 음악이든 뭐든 하다 보면 이게 왜 내가 이걸 하고 있지? 라는 생각을 해요. 근데 내가 미래에 더 재밌으려고, 미래에 더 행복하려고 하는 거다. 라는 그 목표를 잊지 않게 자음으로 이걸 했습니다. 지금까지 살아오면서 일이든 학업이든 멈춰본 적이 없는 것 같은데요. 조금이라도 쉬면 도태된다는 느낌도 들고 어, 자음형이 됐던 것도 그렇고 진달한다기보다는 뭔가를 계속 해야 된다라는 그런 부분 때문에 항상 가지고 있는 생각이 됐던 것 같아요. 제가 지금까지 살면서 많은 이들의 도움이 있었는데요. 지금 제가 이렇게 앉아서 여러분들과 대화할 수 있는 것도 모든 그 분들의 도움이 있었기에 이 자리에 있다고 생각 들어요. 그 앞으로도 그매 순간 감사하면서 잊지 않고 꼭 기억하겠습니다. 
our headlines on this Thursday afternoon, September 1st. South Korea posted a record trade deficit of 9.4 billion US dollars in August on the back of soaring energy prices, which saw the cost of imports surpassing that of exports. Delegates from South Korea have proposed to their US counterparts the establishment of a consultative body to further address the issue of eliminating subsidies for electric vehicles assembled outside of North America. A super strong typhoon is rapidly moving towards the Korean peninsula and while pundits believe its strength will weaken, it is still expected to bring strong winds and heavy rain to the southern parts of the country. We begin with news about an expansion of the South Korean economy in the second quarter. According to the Bank of Korea on this Thursday, the country's GDP seasonally adjusted for inflation grew 0.7% during the April to June period compared to the previous quarter. This revised data matches the advance estimate released back in July. Officials also point out the economy expanded at a faster pace compared to the 0.6% growth recorded in the first quarter. The accelerated growth has been linked to private spending, which rose 2.9% on quarter in the absence of COVID-19 related restrictions. Exports, however, shrank 3.1% on quarter amid soaring energy expenses worldwide. And speaking of escalating global energy prices, South Korea posted a record trade deficit in August as the cost of imports surged past that of exports. Our Ideon reports. South Korea recorded its biggest ever trade deficit in August. The latest trade data released on Thursday by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy revealed that the balance of trade last month showed a deficit of over 9.4 billion U.S. dollars. That's a record figure since the relevant data was first compiled in 1956. It's also the first time in 14 years that a deficit has been seen for five months in a row. Goods exports amounted to roughly 56.6 billion U.S. dollars in August, rising 6.6 percent on year. That's an all-time high for any month of August, despite Russia's invasion of Ukraine and tightened monetary policies around the world. Driving exports were petroleum products, cars and rechargeable batteries, which all saw record high exports for any month of August, too. However, exports of semiconductors dropped for the first time in just over two years on reduced demand and lower prices. And while all-time high goods exports would normally be seen as impressive, imports were also up 28.2 percent year on year to around $66.1 billion. That's yet another all-time high figure, largely due to high energy and commodity prices. Imports surged as scorching weather in August contributed to greater demand for energy with oil, coal and gas use increasing. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, there's been a fresh presidential pledge of support for the country's export-related businesses amid the current climate of economic challenges. Our presidential office correspondent Yoon Jung-min has details. South Korea is doing all it can to shore up exports and overseas construction projects. This was President Yoon song yeols main focus at a weekly economic affairs meeting on Wednesday at Busan New Port in the city of Changwon. The president has vowed to remove hurdles for exporters as fast as possible. For that, there will be record levels of trade financing for exporters worth 351 trillion Korean won or some 261 billion U.S. dollars. At the same time, the government is looking into cutting more red tape for businesses. Korea also aims to strengthen its competitiveness for overseas construction projects targeting markets in the Middle East, Asia and Central and South America. Yoon 
Yoon will continue with his sales diplomacy, hoping for another overseas construction boom, citing recent deals with Poland and Egypt for arms sales and the nuclear power plant project, respectively. Meanwhile, Seoul aims to manage trade relations with Beijing, seeking more cooperation in ICT and green industry amid a recent decline in exports to China. While chip prices are falling, officials say high energy prices also remain a concern responsible for Korea's month-long trade deficit. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Over in Washington, D.C., talks between South Korean officials and their U.S. counterparts over the latter's plans to eliminate subsidies for electric vehicles assembled outside of North America have ended with a proposal for a joint consultative body to further address the matter. Our Kim Dami has more. Washington responded positively to Seoul's proposal to create a joint consultative channel to efficiently talk through issues related to the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Wrapping up a three-day visit to Washington on Wednesday, the head of the South Korean Trade Ministry's a new trade order strategic bureau told reporters that the U.S., including the White House, fully understands Korea's concerns. An song il added the Biden administration realizes the severity of the matter and is ready for talks as they consider South Korea an ally. Details on forming a consultative body will be discussed during a visit by South Korea's trade minister to Washington next week. Officials from the South Korean Ministries of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Finance have already requested that the U.S. Trade Representative and Commerce Department revise the bill and delay its enforcement until 2025. By that time, South Korean automaker Hyundai Motor is expected to have a complete deconstruction of an EV plant in the U.S. That will make buyers of its vehicles eligible for the U.S. tax credit of $7,500, which the Inflation Reduction Act eliminates for cars assembled outside of North America. But in terms of holding negotiations, the clock is ticking. In order for the bill to be amended or even for enforcement to be delayed for two to three years, there needs to be approval from both the Senate and House of Representatives. In fact, the U.S. side reportedly said it will take some time to analyze because the bill has just recently been passed. The latest issue is expected to also top the agenda during a trilateral meeting between the National Security Advisors of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan in Hawaii this week. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Back on the local front, the first regular session of the National Assembly under the UN administration kicks off today. Now, scheduled for 100 days through December 9th, the regular session is tasked with, among other urgent matters, the passing of next year's budget bill. Also, a last-minute deal between the ruling and opposition parties and a bill to lower the comprehensive real estate holding tax is expected to be passed at today's plenary session. The bill keeps homemakers who temporarily own two houses from being taxed and allows elderly homeowners and long-term owners of a single residential property to postpone their payment. Confirmation hearings for education and health minister nominees will also be held. As for the upcoming schedule, the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea and the ruling People Power Party will deliver opening speeches on the 14th and 15th of this month. That will be followed by a four-day Q&A session with government officials from September 19th to the 22nd, with different topics covered each day. A parliamentary audit of the government and state agencies will begin on October 4th and end on the 24th of that month. Military authorities here and their U.S. counterparts kicked off the counter-attack phase of the Ulchi Freedom Shield at the start of this week, staging one of their largest live fire drills. Our Defence Ministry correspondent Peonji covers that. The South Korea-U.S. Combined Division conducted live fire field training this week, involving hundreds of troops, mortars and battle tanks. The South Korean Army announced Wednesday that the Combined Joint Fires Coordination Exercise was held for three days, starting Monday. It said the Combined Division has been preparing for this drill since the beginning of the year to improve its ability to conduct combined operations as well as to enhance their interoperability. This was the first and the largest drill held by the division since it was created in January 2015, consisting of units from both of the Allies' armies. The exercise took place at four different training locations, including the Rodriguez Live Fire Complex in Potan City, located just south of the heavily fortified demilitarized zone along the border. Wednesday's training in Potan involved live fire training using tanks and mortars, 
and brought together troops from the Korean Army's 16th Mechanized Infantry Brigade and the 28th Infantry Division, as well as those from the U.S. Rotational Ready First Brigade and the U.S. 7th Air Force. The exercise also took place in Gangneung, where multiple launch rocket systems were fired, and Paju, where a mortar live fire exercise was conducted. This is the first time that the South Korea U.S. Combined Division has conducted a division-level live fire exercise and worked as a team under a single command structure. He added that they will continue to strengthen the Allies' combined defense readiness. Peunji, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the status of North Korea's human rights was addressed here in South Korea between the country's top diplomat and the newly appointed UN expert on related affairs. Our foreign ministry correspondent Min Sukyun has more on the gist of that exchange. South Korea's foreign minister Park Jin met with the visiting UN special rapporteur for North Korea's human rights, Elizabeth Salmon, this Wednesday afternoon. During their talks, Park said the country was deeply concerned about the human rights situation in North Korea. And we will proactively cooperate with the international community, including in the United Nations, for promotion and protection of human rights in North Korea. In this regard, we stand ready to provide you with, you with all the necessary support. He also stressed the government's willingness to take an active role on the issue while mentioning the appointment of South Korea's new ambassador for North Korean human rights. My government appointed Professor Lee Shin Hwa, uh, who is here with us today, uh, as ambassador for international cooperation on North Korean human rights in July. My government is actively assisting the activities of Ambassador Lee, uh, and we look forward to the close cooperation between you and Ambassador Lee on the North Korean human rights issue. The UN Special Rapporteur expressed her gratitude for South Korea's strong support and looked forward to their joint cooperation. And I'm sure that we will work uh, with your help uh, together, building synergies to try to improve uh, the situation of human rights in the DPRK. Meanwhile, this Friday, Salmon is also scheduled to meet with South Korea's unification minister, Kwon Young Se. She's then expected to hold a press conference later that day to talk about the results of her visit. Her trip comes as the rapporteur seeks to collect information on North Korea's human rights situation for an upcoming report to the UN General Assembly next month. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. On that note, we end part one of the Daily Report. In part two, we discuss the latest on COVID-19 here and elsewhere. Stay with us. matters.
On Viewpoint today, we address the latest on COVID-19 here and over in the US as bivalent vaccines, boosters that is, look to be available to the public this autumn. Also here in South Korea, authorities have announced a further ease in restrictions to commemorate this year's Chuseok celebrations. For more, I have Professor Kim Mungyu from Yonsei University here in the studio. Professor Kim, welcome back. Thank you for having me. I also have Professor Peter Chin Hong at the University of California, San Francisco, live on the line. Professor Chin Hong, it's a pleasure to see you again. Always a great time, Sunny. Thank you for having me. Right. Professor Kim, let's start with a few words on the government's latest decision to eliminate the requirement for negative COVID-19 test results upon entry into South Korea starting September 3rd, which would be this coming Saturday. What are your thoughts on this decision, Professor Kim? The test we use was a PCR test or rapid antigen test. And actually, uh, rapid antigen test is reliable only when it is positive. So this kind of screening was already having some hidden limitations, screening out any uh, possible infections coming into our country. Anyway, I welcome this decision and uh, still uh, we have to do the test within 24 hours after the entry and uh, it is most like other countries. Well, we need a backup plan to uh, for, uh, to only detect any massive outbreak in the future, and especially a plan for uh, elderly or people with underlying conditions. And uh, recently, I got a uh, official letter from the uh, health government that uh, the uh, emergency medical service should work more efficiently because. Uh, if a patient needs uh, admission, it's not uh, easy to find the available bed. So uh, still, we are in struggling with uh, this kind of situation. We right, have to I see. That, yeah. Meanwhile, Professor Chin Hong, the U.S. for its part revoked this requirement of a negative uh, COVID-19 test result upon entry to the U.S. back in June, I believe. Do you suppose this move is an inevitable part, perhaps, of uh, resuming life amid the prolonged pandemic? I agree with that too, Sunny, and I agree with all the points that Professor Kim brought up. You know, if you're using a rapid antigen test, we are getting more and more data showing that it, there are a lot of false negatives as well because it's starting off in the throat. And if you do a nose swab, you may not get a positive test even though you have infection in you. Um, added to that, there has also been a big uh, industry of fraud with people giving uh, false uh, negative tests uh, that you can pay for. So I think there are multiple reasons why it didn't work and it's reuniting families, it's allowing people to move more freely and it's also affecting the economy positively. Right. And Professor Kim, back here on the local front, Chuseok celebrations this year come with virtually no COVID-19 restrictions as highway toll fees are being lifted during the holiday period to allow or encourage travel. And eating is also being permitted on public transportation, including trains and buses to hometowns. But regardless of this reality, I understand restrictions at nursing homes remain in place. And that being said, how is Korea faring with its uh, treatment, care that is, of critical COVID-19 patients, including the elderly? I always look at the uh, pattern of uh, this outbreak through the uh, uh, website Our World in Data. And we have a good news. Uh, this outbreak was because it came from BA5 variant and it had reached the peak in August 22nd. And since that day, it's declining in a very fast speed. So this is a good news. We have plenty of reason to ease in our quarantine measures for this Chuseok. Um, this a BF5 outbreak started uh, about the end of July, and uh, I think uh, by the end of September, this BF5 might uh, fade out, and uh, uh, we're going to be in a stable status. But uh, vigilance is still needed, especially in a situation such as uh, nursing homes and hospitals, uh, any public space that uh, elderly or uh, people with underlying condition might gather. And uh, uh, right now, as we ease our quarantine measures, uh, the people, the person or the patient who has any risk factors should keep his uh, personal uh, hygiene very uh, strictly. Uh, that will be a good contribution for our whole country. 
Right, of course. And Professor Chen Hong, what can you share with us about efforts there in the US to better protect and perhaps treat, of course, those at high risk? Well, Sunny, there are two main interventions now that the US is uh, banking on to protect the most high risk. Uh, of course, there are vaccines, vaccines, and vaccines, including boosters, um, which has been the emphasis for a long time. But added to that, for people who can't make their own antibodies, there's, of course, long-acting monoclonal antibodies like Evusheld. And on the other hand, even if you don't want to get vaccinations, there are now therapies like Paxlovid and at least three alternatives like uh, monoclonal antibodies, short-acting, um, uh, remdesivir for three days and uh, malupiravir made by Merck. So all of these are options for people, even if you're not vaccinated and high risk, to keep you away from the hospital. Right, and staying with vaccines, Professor Kim, bivalent uh, boosters will be available here in the country starting from the fourth quarter. Is this an appropriate time frame, I mean, to protect the public from a very much anticipated uh, rebound this winter? First of all, we have to understand what kind of bivalent uh, vaccine is it available. Uh, the vaccine, bivalent vaccine from Moderna was against the uh, original Wuhan strain and BA1, which is also known as Omicron. Uh, for remind, uh, uh, Omicron do not share mutations with uh, the most famous uh, mutations previously occurred. And scholars do not know how and how when did it start exactly? So still there are possibility for new variants to emerge or new sub-variant to emerge. Uh, recently, Pfizer also uh, developed another uh, bivalent vaccine, which is against the uh, original Wuhan strain and BA4 and 5. And uh, well, for high-risk patients, might have already vaccinated many times or passed through previous infections, those people might be uh, meaningful, uh, might gain some uh, meaningful significance benefits from those bivalent uh, vaccines. Uh, for the rest of the people, uh, I still have to think about it and uh, we have to define whether this kind of bivalent vaccine is to prevent infection or to prevent severe cases. If it's for to prevent severe cases, I agree with those bivalent vaccines, but I'm not sure whether it's going to prevent infection or not because uh, the Omicron outbreak is almost finishing and uh, actually we might have to prefer, prepare for a new variant to emerge and we don't know whether it's going to be a, a uh, sub-variant of Momicron or a totally new one. Right, there is the uncertainty there then. Yeah. Professor Chen what is the latest with regard to the rollout of bivalent vaccines there in the US? Well today, um, as many people know, uh, the FDA approved in the US um, the Pfizer and Moderna boosters version 2.0, which as Professor Kim pointed out, includes not only the original Wuhan uh, strain, but also BA4 and BA5. Um, the original vaccines are spectacular at preventing serious disease, hospitalization and death. But what it's hoped for, and of course we not, we're not really sure yet, is that the new and improved boosters will also prevent or do a little bit better job at preventing breakthrough infections because they've been very, very disruptive to society here with people isolating at home, people taking time off work to take care of people isolating at home, schools being missed, um, workplaces being disrupted, even Broadway productions. So that's the hope, but we don't have a lot of firm data yet. But nevertheless, the Biden administration has bought 170 um, you know, million uh, of the new uh, bivalent uh, boosters uh, in an attempt to really try to mitigate the effects of the virus on just everyday life. Right. Professor Kim, the fatality rate of COVID-19 remains at 0.12% here in South Korea. 
I believe at least 44 children have lost their lives to COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic here in the country. I understand 29 of them were unvaccinated. And that being said, and speaking as a pediatrician yourself, what would you like to highlight about the importance of inoculation for children with pre-existing health conditions? I used to say that the uh, pediatric age group is uh, relatively safe uh, when they get infection with COVID-19. but. This kind of my uh, perception was wrong, and uh, we do have uh, mortalities, which is quite low still. But uh, recently, our team also experienced a uh, fatality case. Uh, the patient had a very severe heart condition, and uh, I think it was already critical, but COVID-19 was a kind of a final blow for this case. So, yeah. It's highly recommended for those patients to have a uh, vaccination, which is effective. And also, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the uh, side effects. So uh, I like Novavax as a good candidate for children because uh, it less, uh, has less side effects. And uh, about little more than a half uh, of those uh, fatalities in children had a uh, underlying conditions. And uh, this also means that the other half didn't have a uh, underlying condition. So why those healthy, previously healthy children get sick and uh, die because of COVID-19? Uh, research is needed uh, meticulously. And uh, uh, if there's any other uh, new high risk factors among children, it should be ad uh, addressed and uh, those people, those children should have a vaccination as soon as possible. Right, of course. Professor Chin Hong, the Biden administration, I understand, is reportedly planning to shift COVID-19 vaccine coverage to the private market as soon as next year. What are your thoughts on this particular plan? Well, I'm a little bit worried, Sunny, because uh, as uh, uh, many people know, the U.S. doesn't have a single payer. We don't have a national health system. So that means some people left behind. And of course, this is a public health emergency still. Um, I think that uh, they've already started diverting resources from testing into vaccines and therapeutics like Paxlovid. Um, and Congress still hasn't approved the $10 billion we're hoping for to continue to pay for additional therapies. So unfortunately, it will probably go into the public um, and private uh, market. Um, and I'm a little bit worried, but you know, we will try to cross that bridge when we get to, and as I mentioned, they already pre-purchased 170 million new boosters so hopefully that will help to ease the transition right hopefully and staying with that professor kim what are your thoughts on south korea possibly directing covid 19 vaccine coverage to individuals themselves in the near future uh, i think it's not a matter of yes or no uh, right now it's covered by the government and uh, for children we have about 17 kinds of vaccines covered by the government it's uh, very famous ones, and uh, if it spreads, it's going to be a very critical uh, infections among populations such as diphtheria, etc. And still, we have uh, vaccines which is not covered by the uh, government, which is kind, of, which is a rotavirus and other kinds. So, it's uh, it's the uh, decision of health authorities to evaluate COVID-19 and uh, where it should be located. And uh, as uh, Professor Ching Wong uh, mentioned, uh, the bivalent vaccine is coming. And if the government has to decide, I think they will uh, decide with those bivalent vaccines, not the uh, uh, vaccines we already had. And Korea has a huge outbreak in the early uh, 2022. So most of the Koreans are infected with Omicron. And before Omicron outbreak, uh, Korea kept the instance of uh, COVID-19 relatively low. So uh, uh, it's a little bit different from other countries. So there will be another point that the uh, government had to uh, uh, consider. Right. And moving beyond vaccines, Professor Chin Hong, amid 
the rebounds and retreats in COVID-19. Some have suffered the misfortune of reinfection, while others have remained unaffected altogether. That being said, Professor, is there, do you believe, a genetic element, so to speak, that's possibly keeping them better protected? Well, this phenomenon now has been termed uh, NOVID as opposed to COVID. And I think most of the people who have NOVID, meaning they've had the same alleged exposure but not developed disease, probably didn't know they had it before. In fact, some of the data in the U.S. suggests that uh, as many of uh, more than 70 percent already have had some exposure, even though they don't all add up to the official numbers. Um, genetics is possible. There have been some genes identified, but they're probably not contributing to a large proportion of those people who haven't gotten infected yet. Um, some of them also might be related to why people are not getting quite as sick as others. And there's also some contribution from drugs and even allergies. So it's a, a very complex picture, but something that's really, really helpful to science because it may help us develop therapeutics in the future. Right. Hopefully that will be the case. All right, Professor Chinong, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts today. And Professor Kim here in the studio, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Thanks so much. On the weather front, a super strong typhoon is paving its path towards the Korean peninsula, but pundits believe its strength will weaken upon landfall here. Our Ishio reports. The strongest global storm of this year, Typhoon Hinamnor, has strengthened to a super strong typhoon, and according to Thursday's forecast, it may reach the Korean peninsula early next week. According to the Korea Meteorological Administration on Thursday, Hinamnor was about 400 kilometers southwest of the Japanese island of Okinawa on Thursday morning. It is moving westward through the Pacific Ocean at about 27 kilometers per hour, packing a maximum central wind speed of 55 meters per second, around 200 kilometers an hour. It's expected that the typhoon will continue to move further southwest before turning northward on Friday. Then in the early morning next Tuesday, September 6th, it will reach just south of Jeju Island. On Tuesday morning, it is forecast to pass by the eastern side of Jeju and pass the peninsula through the Korea Strait. But the exact route of the typhoon remains uncertain. The Korea Meteorological Administration classifies the intensity of typhoons into four categories, normal, strong, very strong and super strong. Currently, a super strong typhoon, Hinamnor could create enough force to destroy buildings. Typhoon Memi, which left a lot of damage on the Korean peninsula back in 2003, was also classified as a super strong typhoon. Fortunately, as Hinamnor reaches the Korean peninsula, it will likely weaken to a very strong typhoon, which has maximum wind speeds of 158 to 194 kilometers per hour. A very strong typhoon can move or push over people and large rocks. If Hinamnor moves as expected, Jeju and the southern parts of South Korea will be affected by strong winds and rainfall. Beginning on Thursday, the oceans near the Jeju Island will be affected. Then on Friday, the winds and rain will start affecting the island and southern parts of the peninsula, dropping 30 to 80 millimeters of rain per hour. A wind and waves advisory is expected to be issued for Jeju Island on Friday. Some parts of Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces may also experience rain. Lee Si-hoo, Arirang News. In Ukraine, new UN nuclear experts, that is, are finally in the country on a mission to ward off a potential nuclear mishap at a Russian-occupied power plant. Our Lee Seung jae has the latest. Fourteen members of the International Atomic Energy Agency's inspection team have arrived in the southern Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia on Wednesday. Their mission there is to prevent an accident at the nearby Russian-occupied nuclear power plant and to try to stabilize the situation after weeks of shelling in the area. According to Reuters, a team of inspectors are likely to spend the night in the city before visiting the plant on Thursday. However, Ukraine and Russia are clashing over how long the visit will take as the nuclear power plant is currently under the control of Russian forces. Ukraine says it will take days, while Russian officials say they'll only be there for a week. But IAEA chief Rafael Grossi says the inspection should take several days. 
Well, the mission will take a few days, and, uh, and if we are able to establish a permanent presence, uh, or a continued presence, uh, better said, uh, then it's going to be prolonged. But this first segment, so to speak, is going to take a few days. Russian forces captured Europe's largest plant back in March, with the Ukrainian workforce continuing to run the facility. While Grossi said the visit was a technical mission that aimed to prevent a nuclear accident, Ukraine's energy minister said the IAEA inspection was a step towards deoccupying and demilitarizing the site. Nevertheless, the biggest focus will be staving off the possibility of a dangerous nuclear accident, something that's more likely if the IAEA can have a sustained presence at the power plant, according to the IAEA chief. Lee seung Arirang News. Back here in South Korea, the city of Koyang is hosting an exhibition that seeks to share hydrogen's potential to revolutionize the global energy industry, as it's long been hailed as a green solution to the world's plight amid climate change. Our Shin Hayoung was there. The use of hydrogen as a clean source of energy is becoming more important due to climate change and the energy supply chain crisis. South Korea has been taking a bigger role in the global hydrogen industry. Before transitioning to a hydrogen economy, countries and companies around the world are competing to take the lead. South Korea has already done so in the field of hydrogen utility, especially in the mobility sector. This was said on Wednesday during the opening ceremony of the H2 Meet 2022, the largest hydrogen exhibition in Korea, previously named the Hydrogen Mobility Plus Show. At this year's exhibition, around 240 companies and government organizations from 16 countries are showcasing their latest technologies related to hydrogen production, storage, distribution and utilization. A hydrogen-powered police bus is one of Hyundai Motors' flagship models. It doesn't emit any gas nor doesn't make any engine noise. The company also unveiled a street cleaning truck that's powered by hydrogen fuel cells and is expected to be commercialized at the beginning of next year. SKENS, a liquefied natural gas provider, presented some of its hydrogen technologies and products. Like its electrolysis equipment that produces hydrogen from water, a hydrogen storage system and a hydrogen-powered forklift. Domestic steelmakers POSCO plans to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 through its technology called Hyrex, an eco-friendly hydrogen-based reduction steelmaking model. Currently, there are still a lot of difficulties in hydrogen production like large conversion costs. I hope the government deals with these issues with new policies. Companies like us can accelerate their investments when the government provides support like incentive. Prime Minister Han dok said that the government will diversify the country's hydrogen production and look at ways to revise the regulations in order to support technological development and investment. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy announced on Monday that it has selected 19 tasks that will help accelerate companies' activities and secure safety in the hydrogen industry. Companies have been sending suggestions to the ministry since June this year. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. Moving from clean energy to creative entertainment, the popularity of Korea's screen productions is fueling renewed interest in platforms that bring together content creators and potential buyers. Our Kim jong shil covers one such platform. Broadcast Worldwide is an annual global content market that hosts production companies and buyers from all over the world. This year, the event is being held fully in person for the first time in three years. Asia's biggest broadcasting content market hosts more than 160 production companies from 17 different countries, and buyers from all over the world are taking part in a search of the next big hit. An official at Korea Creative Content Agency, the organizer of BCWW, said the main goal is to promote business opportunities for production companies so that they can have more opportunities in the global market. Since it's a market, we aspire to sell lots of Korean content, but as a market, content providers from overseas can also come here and freely promote and sell their work. 
Speaking of successful K-content, the creators of the Netflix hit Extraordinary Attorney Wu had a special session to discuss the global success behind the series. I realize that if done with consideration, the sensibility of the audience is much more accepting of stories regarding the disabled, diversity and minorities. The show's main character, Woo Young-woo, is an attorney who suffers from autism spectrum disorder. The Netflix series is a global hit and went on to reach number one in 20 countries. Now Extraordinary Attorney Wu is just one of many Korean shows that have captivated audiences around the world. One buyer from Indonesia told Arirang News that South Korean content is very popular in their country as the sentiment of family and relationships are quite similar. Buyers from Amazon Prime, Warner Media, and NBC Universal are here looking for the next big thing until the event comes to a close this Friday. Kim Jong Shil, Arirang News. Also on the cultural front, the former presidential office of Chongwade has on public display diverse works of art by disabled artists. My colleague Song Yujin highlights some of them. An exhibition by and for the disabled. From Wednesday, artists with disabilities are showcasing their creations at Chongwade or the Blue House located in central Seoul. It's the first exhibition held at the former presidential office following plans to change it into an art and cultural compound. Here at the exhibition hall located on the second floor of Chuncheguan, which used to be the press briefing room, 60 pieces of artwork are on display. They come in a wide variety of genres ranging from Korean art, Western art and telegraphy to crafts. As of last year, there are 557 disabled artists in South Korea. 50 were selected to have their work on display. The painting Percy Jackson in Math Drawings by Kim Hyun-woo, who has Down syndrome, was temporarily moved from the Yongsan presidential office for the exhibit. Artist and actress Chong Eun-hye, who has the same disability, is also taking part. Not to mention embroiderer Lee Jung-hee, who is an intangible cultural heritage of the Jeollabukdo province. Visitors can also enjoy pieces by emerging artists. I'm feeling all different kinds of emotions. When Chinon was young, I was worried that he might not even be able to say the basics like I'm hungry. But he slowly got better and is now showing off his artistic talent and even speaking in front of the camera. But this exhibit also took visitors with disabilities into consideration. For the visually impaired, there is a brochure in Braille and audio commentary that describes each piece vividly. There is sign language interpretation for those who are hearing impaired and access for people in wheelchairs. We want to show the general public that disability does not stop people from being an artist. We also hope that disabled artists and their work will be appreciated more. The exhibition is open every day except Tuesdays until September 19th. Those visiting on the weekend will have a chance to meet the artists in person. Entrance is free of charge and no reservation is needed. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Russia has shut off gas supplies to Europe yet again. The flow of gas through the 1,200-kilometer-long Nord Stream 1 pipeline was halted on Wednesday, with Moscow claiming that a compressor in the pipeline needs maintenance. According to Russia's state-owned Gazprom, there will be no supply for the next three days. The move comes amid increasing tensions between the EU and Russia due to the war in Ukraine and subsequent Western sanctions imposed on Moscow. The shutdown also puts more pressure on European countries to ration gas supplies ahead of winter. The pipeline is capable of transporting some 170 million cubic meters of gas per day, but as of July 27th has only transported 20% of its capacity to Europe. The reduced flow followed a similar maintenance shutdown, which lasted for 10 days. New York City's Times Square and a number of other locations in the state of New York are set to become gun-free zones. 
This comes as new gun laws in the state take effect over the course of this week, with most of them beginning on Thursday, local time. One of the laws makes it a felony to carry a gun in parks, schools, courthouses, and several other locations without special authorization. Speaking at a Wednesday news conference, New York State's governor said that the new laws include more requirements on gun safety training, stricter background checks, and shorter gun license renewal periods. The new laws, which were passed in July, are a response to the Supreme Court ruling in June that said carrying weapons in public is a constitutional right. Germany's government has reached a compensation agreement with the bereaved Israeli families of the victims of the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre. This news was announced in a joint statement made Wednesday by the presidents of both Germany and Israel. While Germany has not officially announced the figures, a report by Süd Deutsche Zeitung said the compensation comes to roughly 28 million US dollars. The agreement comes after a previous compensation offer was rejected by the families who threatened to protest by boycotting a ceremony marking the 50th anniversary of the tragedy. It also marks the third and final round of payments made to surviving relatives after initial compensation in 1972 and later in 2002. The Munich Olympics massacre saw Palestinian militants from the Black September group kidnap members of the Israeli Olympic team. Eleven Israelis and a German policeman were killed, as well as five of the militants. An ancient elephant tusk has been uncovered at an Israeli archaeological dig site. Displayed on Wednesday by a team of archaeologists, the tusk is estimated to be around 500,000 years old and from a straight tusked elephant. Marking the largest fossil tusk found in the Near East, it was discovered in the southern Israeli village of Rivadim. But the discovery has raised questions, as prehistoric flint tools were also found, suggesting the elephant was hunted by prehistoric man, possibly as a social ritual. Measuring 2.6 meters and weighing 150 kilograms, researchers believe this prehistoric elephant would have been substantially larger than modern-day African elephants. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Thursday afternoon. It's the first day of September, but temperatures are behaving like it's late summer. High temperatures are prevalent across the country, hitting 30 degrees in Seoul and 28 degrees in Daejeon, Daegu, and Gwangju. As temperatures soar rapidly, there are double-digit gaps in readings in most regions. And the skies are bright in central regions, but it's quite murky in southern areas with rain in the forecast. Starting from Jeju, rain clouds will expand, and torrential downpours will batter Jeju Island and the south coast with heavy rain of up to 30, 300 millimeters and 100 millimeters, respectively. And meanwhile, the super strong typhoon Hennam Nor is expected to change its direction and head for the Korean Peninsula. So the whole country might be directly affected by the typhoon. And Hinnam Nor has the potential to knock down trees and damage buildings. So always stay weather aware. And we'll have nationwide rain from next Monday and Tuesday due to the effect of the typhoon. And we'll keep you updated if there are any changes. Now, let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. And that is all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Report. We'll be back with more coverage tomorrow. That is Friday. Join us then. Thank you for now.
It's finally your vacation. 